You're very welcome to another episode of the Scaling Your Business podcast. For this episode, we're joined by David, the founder of Pranos.ai. David is based all the way over on in the United States of America. David, you're very welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Delighted to have you. Typical fashion of the show is to focus on three main areas, early influences, challenges, and pivotal moments. If I'm speaking too fast, just let me know and I'll slow down. I have a tendency to speak fast. But uh, no different with you. We'll spend the first couple of minutes getting to know you and then dive deep into the good stuff. You were born in Costa Rica, spent a good chunk of your youth growing up in Germany, and now you're back in the States. I know you went to university in Utah. Don't know where you're based at the moment. But talk to me about what it was like. I don't know how long you spent in Costa Rica. All I know is that you were born there. But what it was like growing up Costa Rica and Germany. Yeah, so I was born in Costa Rica, and then when I was seven, I moved to Germany, and I was there till I was 19, and I went to college in uh, Rollins College in Orlando, Florida, then University of Utah after that, then back to college in Germany, and then, uh, um, you know, uh, and then after that, you know, I got into uh, to the whole startup world, I guess, and that's when we moved to San Francisco. Then- nice. What, what standout memories do you have of your time in Germany? Well, I mean, it's just uh, so many. I couldn't even start to. Was talk. that what your love for football founded? Did you get a love for uh, yeah. certain traditions? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think uh, there was just, I think there's just so many different things that that, that would kind of influence me uh, in Europe. But I, I think one of the biggest things was just all the different cultures that are so close uh, proximity in Europe, and you can just fly out to to a completely different country and different culture and, and it's all it's all kind of nearby so mm. uh, that and then just uh the people and uh overall i just uh i think uh it, it allowed me to look at the world from a more international lens rather than just i'm another american type of thing <laughs> right i uh and i think once you guys kind of learn more about what we're doing it'll make more sense of why that gotcha lens makes sense well, before we jump into that, you mentioned the word influence. The question I like to ask some of my guests around influence is they can usually pick, you know, one, two, three or four people in their life who've had a massive impact or influence on their early years that's turned out to impact the person they've been today. Whether it's, you know, uh, an old friend, a teacher, uh, a, a, a close relative, a distant relative, just an acquaintance. Is there any one person or a number of people that stick out to you that have had a massive impact on who you've become today? Yeah, I think uh, there's been various, right? But aside from just, you know, people in your nuclear family unit, um, one that really stands out that was actually more recent, uh, it was about three years ago, was uh, Dick, uh, Richard, uh, it's actually his name is Richard Kramlich or Dick Kramlich. And he's actually the chairman of NEA, which is one of the top uh, VCs in the world. And he was actually the first early investor of uh, Apple and Steve Jobs himself. Um, kind of an older gentleman now, but I mean, he's probably one of the biggest, he's one of the founders of venture capital as we know it. And, uh, yeah, I mean, just chatting with him and kind of getting to know him and understanding his ethos, um, has been life-changing just to, <laughs> to, to be able to talk to, to the same guy that mentored Steve Jobs himself. It's, um, of course, impactful. So I think that, that is very, very, very cool. Um, and I can certainly see why you've uh, chosen his name. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. Yeah. One thing I want to ask you before we jump into business side of things is, I know that you're into reading and tennis, but what's one thing you like to do in your downtime or outside of work when you've got time off? Uh, honestly, I love to learn. Uh, and that's why this doesn't really seem like work because we're all, we're, all, we're all constantly learning about the landscape that we're actually getting into, but um, I usually just like to learn about different different things, uh, read a lot, listen to podcasts, mm. YouTube videos. Um, it all sounds kind of boring, but that's just what I'm um, nowadays. But yeah, sometimes I'll play tennis. And things like that too, but... Nice, nice. You mentioned Germany. You spent five years as a surgical intern in Germany. Um, did that help you grow as a person? I know I, I lived abroad twice now. I lived in uh, the West Coast and Normandy region of France for eight months, and I lived in Australia for a year. And I know uh, personally that helped me grow massively as a person, but I'm interested in, in you. How did that five month stint in, in, uh, as an intern help you? Yeah. So I was actually pre-med before I got into uh, business and computer science. Mm. That was my, my, my first, uh, 
approach to the to the corporate world or just the market in general was to become a doctor. And uh, so I was fortunate enough to get into the Kopf Clinic, which is one of the top uh, hospitals in Germany and one of the top uh, universities in Germany is University of Heidelberg. And uh, yeah, so I got into this internship and I basically just followed and, and shadowed a lot of doctors and surgeons and it just completely made me look like, it allowed me to look at life in a different way when you're, when you're sitting in the operating room and, and seeing some of these guys get opened up. It just completely changes your home. How, <laughs> so I know it's unrelated with technology, but it was just, uh, I don't know. It, it, it was an interesting perspective. Uh, that was it. Um, I do got to tip my hat to you though. We're going going into the business side of things here now. Co-owner of of Gravit, which is one of your first startups, uh, oh. and that got into the Y Combinator 2018 group. So, and, and for anyone who's not familiar with Y Combinator, uh, they've backed the likes of uh, Stripe, Dropbox, and and another ten behemoths in the industry. They're probably the most recognised. Uh, if you're an alumni of that, it's it's a good group to be in. Uh, one of our previous guests, I actually think it was the reason you ended up on this podcast, uh, No Loco. They've just got accepted into the 2021 group uh, for Y Combinator. So, but that's that's not my question. Uh, that one, I just wanted to pass on. Congrats. My question is that business was for 12 months. I'm interested to know your key takeaways from uh, that business. Yeah, well. It, uh, you know, you learn a lot. I mean, we kind of, we kind of failed really fast. Um, and, you know, we, we kind of closed it down um, once we realized the business model was not viable. But going through the whole program and, and really, uh, it really put uh, the company into this, you know, global spotlight. And I think one of the biggest things that it does is it allows entrepreneurs to really believe in themselves by just putting them in the big, big leagues right away. Even if you're a first time entrepreneur, um, and, you know, and one of the ways they do that is uh, featuring you on TechCrunch, which gets you a lot of press and then you usually get picked up by other news outlets. And then you get, you get approached by huge companies that want to work with you. So I think just that alone is just kind of, it allows these entrepreneurs to kind of believe in themselves to a certain level that allows them to achieve these big things. So, um, yeah, I think that's one of my biggest takeaways from, from that. And then, I mean, of course I could talk about this for days, but hey, you learn a lot from your failures and, uh, you learn, uh, it was, it was definitely, it allowed us to, to kind of self-reflect and understand what we did wrong. Um, and we ran out of runway essentially. That was it. <laughs> you know? Okay. Um, yeah. Your current business now, pranos.ai, uh, can you give us your 30 second commercial before I ask questions? People need to understand what the business is first. Sure. So at Pranos, we're converting car windows into digital displays. Um, and we're commercializing that for consumer use. And most of our software and hardware is all tailored for uh, for turnkey installation and, and use cases. It is remarkably cool to see, and it certainly grabs your attention. I watched the the video on your website, and I can see it grabbed everyone else's attention as I walked by vehicles that had the uh, Pranos.ai uh, product uh, yeah. installed into it. Um, did you always have aspirations to be a business owner because i know you were a surgical intern at the start so is this just uh happen pure coincidence yeah i mean i always had big dreams i actually wanted to be a soccer player growing up like you mentioned soccer oh, nice. i, I grew up in germany did you support what was that what team did uh, you support this is usually uh, fc kaiserslautern when they were in the first league now they're down in the third league but uh, you know hovenheim and a few other german teams that i like but you know germany in germany soccer is huge so i was one of those mm. guys that, you know played soccer growing up, then got into med school. I always wanted to do something big, but then, you know, kind of realized that, uh, you know, kind of gravitated towards business um, and technology. And then I ran into, uh, into this through one of my uh, previous co-founders and, uh, and that was that, but uh, well, that was my, my beginning to, to the technology world. And uh, I don't know, I guess it all kind of, I wouldn't say serendipity, but I think the opportunity presented itself and I just kind of grabbed it and held on to it and kept it going. Um, well, talk, to me a li- uh, talk to me a little bit about it. You said you ran into the idea from one of your co-founders. How did Pranos come about? Yeah, so um, Pranos came out through a lot of different uh, iterative ideas and derivatives from a lot of different concepts and, you know, and scientific breakthroughs. Um, and, and we're just basically packaging into one system 
Um, so it's not like we're reinventing fire or anything like that, but it, there's a lot of proprietary technology that we have built around it as well. But um, it, it on, honestly came through over the years, right? I mean, we wanted to convert car windows into digital displays and we thought that that real estate was impactful to urban, in, in the urban settings. And then we realized that uh, people wanted to purchase these. So we, we realized that we wanted to commercialize it um, for consumers for, to be able to purchase. And uh, you know, a few trips to China, um, being able to really get inspired by, by some of their technologies there and how they were manufacturing certain components that we weren't able to manufacture here at a, at a lower cost. Um, and I guess a few other experiences uh, kind of got us to the point where we were able to commercialize it and package it into a consumer product. But um, I guess I guess overall, it's just just kind of listening to our early adopters. And, and we've done a lot of pilots and case studies and things of that nature. And it, it's always been something that's gravitating. And people, we knew it's something that's special just because of how people react to it when they see it on the street. So that that's how it kind of snowballed mm. into right now. Very, very cool. I can't remember. You're gonna, you're gonna have to forgive me for this, but there's a, there's like a, a famous crossway in either China or Japan, because um, you've mentioned China, and I had a guest on before that lived there for a number of years, very, very close to this famous crossway, and he said living there gave you an idea of what the future would be like in Europe six years from now. So I imagine that you went there and were, were inspired by a lot of the tech, but it's hard to pick out, you know, one of a hundred of the things that are there are going to make it to, you know, mainland Europe and, and the US, but it must have inspired you a lot being over there to look and go, holy crap. Yeah. Well, that's such an interesting concept. And I'm glad that you understand what that is because a lot of mm -hmm. people kind of refuse that that's a reality, it's particularly here in the US. Um, because, you know, there's a lot of negative stigma around China. Um, but if you actually go there, um, you know, in an unbiased way, you start to realize that a lot of these technologies are already accepted by consumers and they're using it and it's working. And like you said, there is a plethora of technologies that won't make it into the West, but, um, but it, it is inspiring to see that, yeah, I would say they're probably 10, 15 years ahead when it comes to some of these things. And, um, but they're all, they're kind of like in their own bubble, right? They're not coming out of their bubble and people are not really coming in. I mean, when I was in China, I didn't really, I mean, I was there for six months and uh, in, in the hotel I was at, I didn't run into one American, right? It was mostly European people, right? From, from, from the UK or other places in Europe. Um, and it's usually senior level execs, right? That are usually within their own group. But if you actually go out there as an entrepreneur like myself and you get to know the people there, get to know the factory owners, actually venture out, it's a beautiful place. It, it really is an interesting place. And I, I, I'd recommend it. Uh, it really uh, changes your perspective on a lot of things. So. I I consider myself well-traveled. I've, I've been stateside a number of times as a reference. I've lived in Australia. I've been all over Europe. I've not yet been to Japan, but it's one of the places top of my list. I know my, my parents both top of their list as well, and I eventually will get out there. Um, but over the, launching this podcast, two people, and you're the third that has mentioned that specific area about just – living 10, 15 years in the future, but not knowing which of those technologies is going to make it. Your yeah. business, Pranos, is going to celebrate two years, or no, it did celebrate two years in June. Um, yeah. And if you had to pick one standout lesson from the last 28 months, um, what would it be? Yeah, I think one of the biggest lessons is to uh, kind of don't rush the process um, mm -hmm. and, and really just focus on the product and building something people really want and, and, and actually release it. And not really worry about potential competitors, things of that nature. Um, and I kind of learned that just from practical experience. And then uh, also just when you're approaching uh, venture, uh, venture capital, institutional investments, um, to really understand uh, what they're looking to see in an investment, right? And you gotta, you gotta, you gotta take off, and you gotta uh, take off a lot of the risk in and, and a lot of these investments, and uh, and a lot of other things that they're looking for. And, I feel like a lot of entrepreneurs just kind of go in front of them and, and they don't realize how delusional they really are with, with, with their valuation and their projections and things of that nature. And I think that's what, that's the learning curve a lot of early uh, young entrepreneurs need to learn, especially if you're pursuing qualified financing or institutional funds is really thinking like they do and, and, and really uh, mitigating a lot of the risk from the deal. Um, and that's it. And it, it does come down to the numbers as well. So. Mm. 
something else you've spoken about before in a, probably a previous interview. I saw it in written format, but I think it was as, as an interview. Uh, if you had to pick three characteristics that were most instrumental to your success, you would choose uh, or you chose transparency, sincerity and conviction. Why those three? Well, um, yeah, go, going through, uh, and actually that was inspired by Thick Kramlik himself, uh, who I also, uh, I talked to him, we had a fireside chat and we talked about this and, and I asked him a few questions and just understanding how, how someone like him, who's, who, I mean, he's created through his fund about $500 billion in, in market value in the world. Um, so he's probably one of the most impactful people, period, but he's not one of the most popular people because the, the CEO, the portfolio CEOs like Steve Jobs and all these other guys, like the CEO of Robin Hood, and they're the ones that take the limelight. But, um, and I'm not trying to go into a tangent here, but he kind of, what I uh, understood from him was just his ethos and his ethics and integrity in business, which is such a, such a high level. Um, you know, when I first got into business or really, when, you know, you, you kind of got influenced by movies and thought that, you know, these very wealthy or really ridiculously successful people were like cutthroat or rude or things of that nature. When you start meeting these guys in real life, they are the most integral. They have so much in integrity and they're just so honest and, and ethical in every way. And uh, that kind of, that, that, that's been something, I guess you have to find that for yourself, but, but when you get to that level, um, that's how you have to operate. And uh, mm. I think, uh, you know, those values, transparency, sincerity, and integrity that you mentioned, um, those are you know, company values and values that I like to strive to be, strive for every day as much as possible, as much as I can. Um, you hold them close to you. What was that? You hold them close to you. Yeah, I like to think so. I mean, I like to strive for it, for sure. I mean, it's, it's the only way to operate, especially if you're trying to build something that scales at a large, uh, anything at, at a large scale, um, or, or even a smaller scale. I mean, that's just the best way to do it. Um, but I guess it has to resonate within. I think a lot of early on, in other words, they think they get screwing people over is the way to the top. And it, it isn't, it isn't, it'll catch up to you. So, uh, sure will. Yeah. What I'm about to mention more than happy to take out of the podcast. If you don't want it mentioned, but I heard it on a previous podcast. So I'll mention it. Um, in the past, DJ, uh, Khaled has expressed interest in your product. Uh, and I know that you said you were talking to Kanye West cousin. So I'm kind of curious, you know, what's, What's the next iteration of Pranos? Where do you go for the next, you know, five years down the line? What are you looking at? Yeah, so we're actually releasing the consumer version here in a few months. And uh, that was actually inspired by the demand from some of these guys uh, or celebrities um, in the music industry, particularly, where they express mm -hmm. interest in, in purchasing them, uh, such as DJ Khaled, Kanye West's uh, team, uh, Mayweather's team, we talked to Lady Gaga's team, Rich the Kid's team. Um, and a lot of the record labels, uh, movie studios, they want to use it for different purposes. Um, so, of course, that's going to be our go-to-market strategy is to equip these uh, influencers, I guess, um, with our technology to make it a hot commodity, right? Uh, that is part of uh, our go-to-market strategy for this particular product line. And, uh, you know, in five years, we, we see ourselves as ubiquitous and something that people like to use in the out-of-home space to, to express themselves run content and also to monetize their driving patterns throughout the city. So the way, the way we're rolling out is strategically done on purpose so we can get the units out um, and people own them. So they keep most of the upside on, on any advertising revenue in the future and they can consider it their own asset. And, uh, and that's just the way we, we feel is the right way to, to roll it out uh, to reach that scale that we need. Some of the names you mentioned, Lady Gaga, Floyd Mayweather, I can certainly see how they would use it in a lead up to a concert or, or, or a fight all around, you know, their vehicles promoting their, their next fight or their next concert um, or just, you know, sending out them on all the taxis across the city that they might be performing in in a, in a couple of weeks' time. Um, sure. You mentioned your go-to market strategy, that being one segment of it. I have this tool that I use and I probably revisit it every quarter. It's called a care tool, which is simply just a diagram for uh, quadrants, uh, keep, attain, recapture, and expand. And I write down the clients that I want to keep, the, the accounts that I want to attain, the ones that I've lost I want to recapture, and the ones that I'm within but I'd like to expand within those accounts. And that helps me frame my go-to-market strategy. 
and kind of make sure that I'm consistently on track and keeping a healthy pipeline. For you, you've mentioned one of the things that's included in your go-to market strategy. I'm curious to know uh, what other things have you included? Does networking play a big role? Does social media, uh, I know you're touching influencers, but the likes of guest appearances on podcasts, uh, creating content for LinkedIn, doing uh, interviews in on big YouTube channels, um, cold calling, what yeah. kind of give me a broad picture of what your go-to market strategy is. Yeah. So I think we're, you know, fortunate that we built something that's intrinsically viral and has a global appeal. Um, like I said, just from some of the earned media that we've gotten and press we've gotten in the past, uh, we've gotten attention from almost every continent in the world already from distributors to co customers all over the world. Um, mm -hmm. So something that definitely is appealing, just, it just makes sense to most people, right. When they see it. Um, and now we have to deliver, deliver that, um, that vision of it, um, which is basically, uh, almost it's, it's basically basically up to par to what we envisioned originally but um like i said intrinsic viral uh, virality is a big thing um but also the network effect right um, once we get the units out um, we notice a lot of uh, referrals and network effect because they are outside so they kind of advertise for themselves um but another thing that's really worked out for us is tiktok as well we've really adopted that when it comes to social mm. media um you know, feel free to follow us at Pranos AI. And uh, I'll leave all the links below to your social platforms and anything we've mentioned, the video that I touched on. I think I watched a, a Euro 2016 video shown on the back of a car, which I thought was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Well, we actually talked to the uh, Champions League, uh, to the agency that, that handles the Champions League marketing. And uh, we're going to do something in Europe um, with, uh, with uh, what's that called? The, forget the company, uh, the company that rents cars. It's not rent a car. It's another one that's huge out there, but uh, uh, they, they wanted to allow us to use their cars and then run some content for the uh, the Champions League during the pandemic. It just didn't end up working out because the product wasn't quite ready for that activation. But I'm um, like I said, we just get approached by a lot of these big brands and big things and events and things of that nature. Um, of course, as far as uh, go to market, we're going to implement a lot of uh, advertising, which just seems to be resonating as well. But Thankfully, this is not really a hard product to, to sell. We've no. got an extensive waiting list for this product. Um, and we've kind of uh, released a few versions in the past, but this time it's going to be the version that we can actually ship out globally. And, uh, David, I love it. I, I, I can imagine several years on the line, your uh, number one, uh, if you were to write down the source of net new accounts, I think 99% of them will come from referrals because you've really got that wow factor. Your product has that factor that makes people stop and go, wow, like right. that's really cool. I like that. And I think they'll go up to the person who owned the vehicle and say, how did you get that? Where did you get that? Hence why I think referrals is going to play a huge part in the future of your business. I'm going to pivot slightly here. Um, uh, and I'd like to know what your definition of success is. Yeah, well, my personal definition of success is, is someone that is a net positive to the world and someone that actually creates a, a difference. Um, mm. and you feel like you've uh, reached the, the closest you can to, to, your, to your fullest potential uh, as an individual. I think I, that's my personal definition. And if you, if you kind of get closer to that every single day, I think that's you're striving, you are being successful. And that's it. So I, I like it. Is there a common myth that is... Uh, about your job title um, or position that you, you know, somewhat or passion. Let's say, yeah, is there a common myth about your job title that you passionately disagree with? And if so, what is it and why? Uh, founder or CEO? Founder. Just the founder title. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think I think I think there is a lot of myths as far as uh, founders getting hosed down as company uh, companies grow, they kind of get uh, replaced by. Uh, you know, private equity CEOs or corporate CEOs. Um, and usually that happens when you don't set up the corporate structure the right way. Um, so again, getting hosed down is a big thing. Um, and I think, uh, I think a lot of founders are starting to understand how, how to avoid that and extenuate those mm. situations. Um, and uh, I think that's a big, that's a big myth. Um, yeah. Other than that, I think, uh, you know, it, I think another myth is, 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 is that a founder has to know everything about, whatever they're doing or they have to be an expert in 
uh, in, in something or other, you know, a world leader in something. Um, a lot of times, it's you're usually the intersection of a lot of different areas. Those are, that's what makes the best founder somebody that kind of just sits in the middle crossroad of a lot of these different areas and disciplines, and somehow connects the dots and delivers it into, into the world in, in, the, in a way that resonates. Um, and that's that's why a lot of these entrepreneurs are sometimes don't even come from you know the background that they're supposed to come from you know and, and still make it. Yeah, so it's it's interesting, but I think hopefully the intersection analogy makes sense mm -hmm. the question i'm about to ask for our american listeners think of high school and for our british and irish listeners think of secondary school both the same thing they're just called something different um if you had the final decision making uh, uh power to decide to add one mandatory subject to the curriculum for high school or secondary school depending on where you're located what would it be and why can you repeat that question again Enough. If you could add a subject to the high school curriculum, the mandatory subject that's not currently on the curriculum, what would you add and why? Yeah, I think I think I think a lot of uh, one subject that would make sense is just uh, some, some something like an apprenticeship. I know a lot of uh, schools in Germany do it. Um, mm -hmm. It's not too popular in the U.S., but um, being able to get hands-on experience from from a lot of different fields and kind of understanding what it's actually like um, in, in the market. I think a lot of a lot of the educational system, particularly in the U.S., doesn't really equip people with with the reality of the world, um, and, and and they learn the hard way when they hit the market. At least most of them do. And uh, that, that's it. I don't know. I, I do think the educational system in Germany, particularly, is is phenomenal at, at really being able to to kind of build uh, professionals that will be successful in the world, in the corporate world. I've asked that question on the last six podcasts I've recorded. And all six have given the same answer. A, a, a slight differentiation, but all six have given roughly the same answer. So interesting. Two final oh, questions for you. That's David, yeah, it's, it's, it is interesting. Obviously, something needs to be done. Um, if I shall ask you, I'll, I'll switch, switch, switch them around. And I'll ask if, how do you continue to learn or invest in yourself? Are there podcasts you listen to, books you read, uh, courses you partake in, reinforcement training you, you do, mentors you go to? So you're saying how I advance my... Uh, my how you my... continue to upskill and invest in yourself to make sure you're a better version of who you are six months from now. Yeah, well, I think uh, it all comes from actually practicing what you read. I think one thing is reading and, and learning, of course, from people you admire in history, but um, actually doing and living by those ethos and those values and implementing them, you start to see them actually make a positive, uh, positive, affecting positive change in your life. And that's when it starts to resonate. And you start seeing that change in your life. But I think that is a big difference is people read a lot, but they don't actually live by what they read, right? They, you know, so people know what to do, the right thing to do, but it's rare for people to actually uh, do the right thing. I don't know, from what I've observed. So. Final question for you is, if I was to hand you a boarding pass that you could write any destination on in the world, what destination would you write on that you were to travel to right now for free, all expenses paid? Just to, just to hang out, I guess. Just to hang out, yep. Uh, you know, maybe yeah, maybe Japan, like what you mentioned. I haven't been to Japan, so maybe that'd be fun. Nice. Well, it's it's certainly top, top of my list. Um, yeah. David, it's it's been a real pleasure spending the last 35, 40 minutes getting to know you a bit more and chatting to you. Um, I wish you continued success in the future. You've certainly got a, a, a cool product in your hands with a number of the names you've mentioned that are interested in it. It definitely has that wow factor. Um, I have no doubt that. Uh, you'll continue to, to work hard to make sure you succeed. But for being my guest today and for spending 35, 40 minutes with, with me, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thanks for having me. No worries. I'll leave links to all your social channels, your reference, TikTok. I'm assuming you've got Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, all the others, and video that I mentioned as well earlier on in the podcast, as well as your website and your own LinkedIn as well, so that people can connect with you to learn more. But for today, we'll leave it there. Thanks for tuning in.